to hold on to it, but to give it away. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot of other verses which, um, which, which, which we can go through if you really want to go through it. And it's um, Matthew 23, verse 23, the outflow of giving. 1 Corinthians 9, 7 to 40, the reasons for giving. It's to sustain the ministry. It's to sustain people who doesn't really have any other needs as well. Galatians 6 verse 6 talks about the generosity of giving. Philippians 4, 10 to 20, it talks about the sacrificial um, size of giving. And in Luke 29, 1 to 40, we see, 1 to 4, sorry, we see Jesus himself sitting at the treasury, looking at people's hearts, and we see the, the widow who give, who give two mites. And he respond to that in the one sentence, and he said, this woman has given everything she has. And, it's, and, and that is, that's the heart that God is looking for, is the real intention. <clears throat> the purpose of giving is because we are selfish, and by giving, we are addressing our own selfishness in the one thing. And um, <clears throat> the real combat for selfishness is generosity and being unselfish in terms of giving. Now we're going on, <clears throat> it says, uh, verse 10, Bring all the tithes into the store so that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this. Some translation says, Test me in this. Try me in this, says the Lord of hosts. For I will not open, uh, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will be none, no, no room to enough to receive it. It's a very, very popular verse, verse, and it's probably been used a lot of out of context. When we're going through in terms of a context here, God is talking about a blessing here, but it's not to say it's a money blessing. Meaning like, I gave you one dollar, God, I expect a hundred back. It's not, it doesn't work like that. God's economy doesn't work like that. God's economy is, in verse 11, He will rebuke with devour. And what does it mean? There would be a blessing, yes, it's in terms of a spiritual blessing. It's sometimes, we sometimes not really see. He will rebuke the, the devour, meaning like He will protect you in the one sense. You're not being sick or... Uh, protect your car and once in that you're not going into an accident. I'm just using examples for one for one and the other reason. God is protecting us day by day and keeping the devourer away from us. There could have been a lot going uh, on for us if we if we don't have God's protecting uh, hand over our lives. <clears throat> it says in verse 11, I will rebuke the devourer. We see there's a spiritual blessing and, 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 and the, the spiritual blessing I would say is more in knowing God. You have a privilege and actually um, a blessing in knowing God above any other people because we can go to God in terms of our troubles and He will help us in one sense. Verse 11 says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that He will not destroy the fruit of your, uh, on, uh, the fruit of your ground. Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for, your, for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Again, God is addressing Himself revealing himself as the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delight, a delightful man. <coughs> this is a very interesting statement because if all nations will call you blessed, nations look in terms of Israel and they see God's interaction with Israel. When Israel is doing the right thing and they see God's hand in that, we are calling them blessed. We can see Israel today as well. And we can see God's blessing upon them. Not because they are living a life um, of acceptance before God, but because they were the government people and God is protecting them. They are a delightful land in the one sense. And because of a delightfulness, and that's God's, always it was in His intention to showcase Israel for the rest of the world, but through Israel, people will come to know Christ and come to know God. And that was always his, his intention, to make them a delight for the rest of the world. And to verse 12 said, All nations will, will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. 
Now we, we're moving on to the next phase. It says in verse 13, Your words have been harsh. Uh, this harsh can probably say, You've been very cynical, uh, very hard against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, What have we spoken against you? There's a bit of arrogance and pride in this statement where the people are saying, What have we spoken against you? You have said it is useless to serve God. That was the people's response. It is useless to serve the Lord. What profit is it that we have kept His ordinances and that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? So now we call the proud blessed and those who do wickedness are raised up. They even thank God and go free. There's a beautiful um, a psalm which addressed this precise issue and is Psalm 73. I'm just going to read the first portion of it, which is a, putting this issue into context as well. It says from verse 1, Psalm 73, Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps are nearly slipped. Had nearly slipped, sorry. For I was envious of a boastful when I saw the prosperity of a wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, and their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set the mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore his people return here, and waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, How does God know? This sounds very similar to what's going on in the time of Malachi. And is their knowledge uh, in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly, who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain. This is very similar to Malachi. And washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I, if I had said I will speak this, behold, I would have been untrue to the generations of your children. When I fought hard to understand this, it was too painful for me. So we saw this whole thing and then just the turning around. And just going to read the turning around. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. And that's precisely what's going around here. We see probably people around us, around us and it's like they're born with a golden spoon in their mouth. Everything they do, it's like, it's just magic. And there's no fear of them in terms of God. They don't fear God, but it seems like they have trouble-free lives. And then nothing goes wrong. I mean, they're always healthy. They, they always have the best toys and stuff like that. And that's what we see. I mean, we probably have friends with that. But then there's a change. And this is what God is basically saying to them. Verse 16. When those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, there's a change. People saw this. And the real people of God start speaking towards another, testifying about God. And it says, and the Lord listened. And this is probably where we move into this area of Malachi, where God is really like intense, busy with His people, He's, he's, he's the true believers. It says, and God listened and heard them. God listened to the conversation. And what, what does God do? So a book of remembrance was written before him. Now this is very interesting. This book can probably be translated as a scroll. But it says, a book of remembrance was written before God. We know that the Bible speaks a lot about books in heaven. Um, <clears throat> we, we read in, in, in Moses when he, when he spoke to God about the... Um, the Israelites who went, went after pagan worship, he said, Blot my name out of your book of life. It seems there's a book of life in heaven. We see in Daniel, when Daniel speaks in, in chapter 12, there's a, there's a book as well where God is saying, 
a book of, um, sorry, let me just find it before I misquote this. He <clears throat> um, just talked about uh, names being written in the book. That's in Daniel 12, verse 1. And in the New Testament, Revelation 20 speaks about this book of life and that these books are open in the end of time. And if your name is not written in the book of life, you basically um, being going to hell. So it seems like in heaven, books are very important to God. And He remembers it. And it's like almost like when He wrote, wrote, wrote down.